All right, y'all may be seated. Before we get into the word, I just want to talk to y'all for a little bit. Um, some of you have heard the, uh, uh, the email that went out about my mom. Um, and I just want to say thank you guys for praying. And just want to ask if you could continue to be praying for her. Um, we've, she's in the hospital um, in Denver. And um, we found out she has to have her liver replaced again. Um, but it's not just her liver, but it's also her kidney. So, <laughs> working all things out with insurance and different things like that. So, the, the operation should happen possibly next week. So, if you could please be keeping my family in prayer um, in the midst of all of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is I just need to address an issue um, with our church as one family in Christ. Um, I got word of some rumors that are going around. Um, and this rumor is, is essentially that I've got this list of female pastors that I'm going to be hiring very soon um, and things like that. And uh, I don't have that, but um, I believe in what God's word says about women in leadership and that women do have a voice in the church. And in accordance with scripture, they will continue to have a voice in this church. Um, that's not something that's new to Calvary Worship Center. We've, we have women in leadership even now. We've had women in leadership for years. We've had women speak from the pulpit. And so it's not outside of Scripture. We're actually inside of Scripture. <laughs> we're utilizing what God's Word says about his sons and his daughters. But I want to tell you, Jesus Christ is the center and the focus of everything that we do here, his Word, everything. We are not ever going to deviate from that. But the reason why I bring that up is because in order for us to be an authentic church, we have to be real with each other. And it is hypocritical to come to church and call each other brothers and sisters and then leave church and talk about each other. And listen, if what I just said makes you uncomfortable, I want you to know that I love you so much. I really do. You guys are my brothers and sisters in Christ. But if being, if being here makes you uncomfortable, I want to encourage you to find another fellowship where you do feel comfortable. And I'm not saying that because I'm like, well, get out of here. No, I don't want you to come to a place where you feel like you can't just be who you are and worship the Lord and feel like you're connected. I want more for you than any, than any of that. And so I just want you to know that I love you. If, if your season here at Calvary Worship Center is done, God bless you. God bless you, seriously. Like, I have so much love and respect for you. But as far as where we're going as a church, this is where the Lord is leading us. And if we're going to move into all that he has for us in the future, we've got to be authentically one. So can we move on from this and get into what God has for us? Amen. All right. Let's get into God's word. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 22. I am very excited about this passage of Scripture, and it's a passage of Scripture that we all know so very well. And it is the moment that Jesus calls his disciples to follow him. And um, these disciples, which is so interesting to me, these disciples will become a part of a group that we refer to as the 12 disciples. And these 12 disciples would take a message to the world, the message of the gospel, and this message would turn the world upside down. But before all of this happened, these fishermen were just regular people. They were fishermen, regular people. And Jesus called them to surrender everything and to follow him. And one of the things that I love so much about this example of the disciples in Scripture is that God still works in the same way that he called the disciples in Matthew chapter 4. In fact, oftentimes when we think about the disciples, we put them on this pedestal and think, well, I, they're just up here and, and, and God used them in this, this crazy, unique way and I wish I could be like them. But the reality is, is that you and I don't have, aren't any different from the disciples. They were just regular people who surrendered their lives to Jesus and God used them in a mighty way. And God still operates that way. When you surrender your life to Jesus, it opens the door for us to be able to be used by him. It opens the door for healing. It opens the door for comfort. It opens the door for our peace. But it means we've got to surrender. As we're going to see today, the disciples had to literally surrender control of their lives to the Lord. 
And if you choose to follow Jesus, we too are also called to surrender control of our lives to the Lord. And I know that that sounds very scary, right? Because we want to be in control. We'd rather be in control than out of control. We'd rather have our hands in everything so that we know the outcome. And the reason why we love that is because we believe that control gives us safety. But the truth is, is that in the kingdom of God, that's not where your safety is. Your safety, your peace is found in the one who's ultimately in control, not in the control that you have. That's where we find peace. That's where we can take these issues, these things that bother us and frustrate us and lay them at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, you're in control of that. I'm not in control of that. And it's when we finally do that, that we actually experience peace. And so as we get into our study today, we are going to see how surrendering all to Jesus opens the door for not only peace, but for us to be able to be used by God in many ways. And so the title of our study, if you're looking for one, is called Surrender All. Let's get into the text. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 22. And what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to read through the whole passage and then we're going to go through and break it up. You good? good. All right. Verse 18. It says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately let down their nets and followed him. And going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with their father, Zebedee. They were mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Now, if you remember from last week, we, we talked about how Jesus had set up the base of his ministry in a city called Capernaum. Now, the reason why Capernaum is a big deal is because Capernaum had a thriving fishing industry in it, and there were so many people involved in it. In fact, when you look back in ancient times, fishing was a great way to make money. Fishing was, was essentially a small business that you would be able to have and to orchestrate and, and to, to profit from. And as we see here with Peter and Andrew, they had a business, a small business, uh, catching fish. And scripture tells us that Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee. And as he walked, he might have seen all these people fishing and casting nets and collecting fish and maybe even selling them. And as he walked along the way, he found Peter and Andrew who were in the midst of throwing their net into the water. And he walked over to them and he said, follow me. And they left everything and followed him. This is so inspirational to me. I love this story. But I also have to ask the question, did it really happen like that? Did Jesus, some random stranger, according to Matthew chapter 4, walk up to Peter and Andrew and say, hey, I want you to leave your business Leave your family, leave the life that you've known, and come and follow me. Now imagine if someone said that to you. A complete stranger walked up to you one day and said, I want you just to leave your family, leave your business, leave your, your way of life, and just follow me right now. You'd be like, no. I don't know you. Why would I follow you? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, as we look here with Matthew chapter 4, what is obvious is that all the details aren't here. In fact, the writer of this gospel, Matthew, doesn't give all the details of this encounter. Not because he's trying to hide information, but it's because he has a specific purpose and audience in mind with his writings. You see, the purpose of this gospel, of the purpose of Matthew's letter here is to prove the reality that Jesus is the Messiah by showing all the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus had fulfilled in his life. And on top of that, Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience who were probably very familiar with the details of the life of Jesus. And so Matthew didn't feel the need to necessarily go into detail because, he, his, because of his audience. So he just cut to the point. Jesus said, follow me. And the disciples said, let's go. In fact, this writing style is reflected within all of the Gospels. Each one is, is a corroborated eyewitness account of the life and ministry of Jesus. But the hard part about, the hard challenge that each gospel writer had to face was the fact that Jesus did so many things that it was impossible to write down every detail. John chapter 21 verse 25 says this. It says, Jesus also did many other things. 
And if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. So the reason why you don't get all the details in each of these gospels is not because they're trying to hide anything, but it's because it's impossible to capture everything that he did. He did so many things. But what I want to clarify is that this was, this, they were not using this as an excuse to avoid unwanted details. You know, kind of like how in some biographers will kind of beautify some of the faults of, you know, historical figures. <laughs> well, he was bad, but he really wasn't that bad. Like, that's not what the gospel writers are trying to do here. In fact, when you read the Gospels, it is very clear that the writers are not professional authors. When you read the Gospels, it's clear to see they give us an unfiltered, unadulterated view of Jesus and his life and those who ministered with him. In their Gospels, we see a a, we see the joy, we see joy, we see anger, we see exhaustion, we see regret, sorrow, pain, and in the midst of it, incredible hope. Because there were so many of these details in the life of Jesus, in order to work, to work with this, each writer decided to adopt a theme in mind for their specific audience that they were writing to all with the goal of providing people with real eyewitness account proof that Jesus isn't just some dude, but he's God. For example, as we already know with the book of Matthew, Matthew's audience is, are, are, is the Jews, and he's writing it with an emphasis on showing how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies to prove to his Jewish audience that Jesus is the Messiah. If we look at the Gospel of Mark, Mark writes a condensed, action-packed version of what Jesus did in his ministry. In, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke writes with the purpose of portraying Jesus as the remedy for the issues of the world. He emphasizes the perfect humanity and the concern for the weak and, the, and concern for the suffering and the outcast that Jesus had for people. And lastly, John John writes with an intention to bring people face to face with the reality that Jesus is not just some teacher, but he is God. All four Gospels work together to provide a complete testimony of the life and the ministry of Jesus. That he wasn't just some random person, but he is God. This is why when we look in Matthew chapter 4, we don't see all the details. This is why we don't see that. But if we, if we want to get a detailed account of what really went on with Jesus calling the disciples here to follow him, we have to go to Luke chapter 5. And in Luke chapter 5, it tells us that Jesus was walking along the, the, the coast there of the Sea of Galilee. But it also adds some details. It tells us that as Jesus was walking, that there was a crowd of people that were following him. Why? Well, if we remember after we got done with... Um, the temptations of Jesus. When he left the wilderness from that experience, he didn't immediately start his ministry. Jesus actually spent time going around healing people, casting out demons, and he even went to a wedding where he turned water into wine. And so Jesus already had a reputation at this time and people were following him. And Luke tells us that people were following him in, in, in a great degree, that there were multitudes following him. And he, and he says in his gospel that as Jesus was walking along the coast that he found Peter, and he asked him, can I use your boat as a platform to teach people? And Peter's like, all right, cool. Jesus gets up on Peter's boat and he begins to address the crowd. He begins to speak to them and to preach to them. And this went on for some time. But then Jesus got down and he said this to Peter. He said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon responded by saying, Master, <laughs> we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down my nets. You can imagine Peter sailing off in his boat to the deep part of the sea and being like, I can't believe I'm about to do this again. I just, I've been out here all night. This teacher want to tell me to do something. Okay. He's letting down his nets, but as soon as, soon as he lets down his nets, Scripture tells us that the boat begins to shake. The nets start to fill with fish, a multitude of fish, so much so that he has to call for help. And the people that he calls for help are James and John, 
There are, there are partners with him in this fishing business. And he says, come over here. The nets are about to break. I need to bring this fish in. And as soon as they bring the fish to the shore, something hits Peter. And he realizes who he's talking to. And he says this to Jesus, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And that is when Jesus said, do not be afraid, for now on you will catch men. It is after all of this that Peter, Andrew, James, and John said, yeah, we're going to leave everything and follow you. <laughs> Which kind of makes sense, right? Like if you, if you witnessed someone do a miracle and they said, oh, I want you to follow me, you'd be like, cool, where you want to go? I ain't, got nothing, I ain't got nothing going on. I can leave it all. <laughs> they witnessed Jesus doing this. They also saw the crowds that followed him. They knew his reputation. Jesus, Matthew didn't, and even Luke didn't have to introduce and say, well, you know, Peter and John had to ask, who are you, Jesus? They already knew who he was. He set up his home base in Capernaum. He had been doing miracles for a while. They knew who he was. And so when he performed this miracle, it was like the icing on the cake. They were like, we're going to follow this guy. But I want you to see something. They willingly surrendered everything in this moment. It took a lot of faith to do this. But they willingly surrendered everything. Everything. Here's what I want you to see. There was no religious obligation here. Jesus didn't come up and go, you better leave your business and come follow me. And they're like, I don't know. You better leave. Like, that, that didn't happen. They willingly left everything. They surrendered everything and chose to follow Jesus. And I'm telling you that I'm saying this to you because their example is still relevant today. If we choose to follow Jesus, it requires full surrender. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been if the disciples were like, hey, Jesus, we can follow you Monday through Friday, but on the weekends, I got to maintain my fishing business. They would have missed out on what God had for them, right? And what is so interesting to me is that when we think about surrendering to Jesus, people suddenly start getting hesitant because they start thinking about the cost of following Jesus. What do I have to give up to follow Jesus? Now, I know that that question comes from a good place, but it's misguided. It's not about what you have to give up to follow Jesus. It's what's about what you gain when you follow Jesus. But on top of that, Jesus doesn't make you give up anything. Did you know that? He doesn't force you to give up anything. Here's what he does. He just shows you more of who he is. And as you see more of who he is, you will be the one saying, God, I don't want that in my life anymore because it gets in the way of my relationship with you. That's what happens when you see more of the Lord. As you see more of him, there is a desire that grows within you. I don't want this in my life anymore. I'm willing to give this up. I don't want that anymore if it means that I can have more of Jesus. I don't want these things that get in my way. I want the Lord. Jesus doesn't make you give up anything. He just shows you who he is. And as you see more of who he is, you naturally, okay, I'll give that up because it gives me a chance to have more of him. This reminds me of a parable that Jesus has spoken in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, where Jesus described the value of the kingdom of heaven. He said this, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. And in his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy the field. Do you understand do you, you catch the, the verbiage there? It doesn't say in his obligation that he was forced to. It says in his excitement, he willingly sold everything so he could get enough money to buy this land that had treasure hidden in it that he discovered. And the emphasis here, the, what this is telling us is that what this person sold wasn't like small stuff. It communicates that this person already had a lot of wealth and they were willing to part with all of it so that they could collect the treasure in this land. 
You see, when you surrender your life to Jesus, in the kingdom of God, surrender is actually a good thing. The world wants us to think that surrender is a bad thing. It's, it's not a good thing. But the reality is in the kingdom of God, surrender is actually a good thing. It actually becomes a joy because whatever we surrender to the Lord, he not only works in our life, but it draws us to him and it produces healing in us. You and I will never be able to grasp the value and the depth and the power of our relationship with God if we are holding things back from him. In fact, religion is this. Religion convinces us that we can compartmentalize our lives into two, two categories. Who we are in church and who we are outside of church. That's not following Jesus. Following Jesus is giving him control over who you are inside the church and who you are outside of the church. He has control over all of it. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to fully surrender. God, I'm not hiding anything from you. Even when it comes to sin, God, I'm not holding on to sin. I'm surrendering it to you. Because when I hold on to sin, it ruins me. It's poison to my life. It robs me of joy. It robs me of peace. It robs me of confidence. So many times in my life, I thought, man, I wish I could just stand for the Lord and be brave for him and do all these things for him. Well, you've got to let go of the things that hold you back from doing that because that is who God has called you to be. But sin will hold you back like shackles. And it's not until you surrender it to the Lord that you begin to walk in your calling and experience the power that God has for you, the confidence that you've never known before. It starts by surrendering. <laughs> surrendering the kingdom of God is not a bad thing. It is an open door to the best thing that God has for you. Like I said, can you imagine if the disciples stayed on that boat? If Jesus said, follow me, and they were like, nah, I'll pass. <laughs> all the things that they would have missed, all the things that they wouldn't have been able to experience. And, and I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but they also died for the faith. You know what? Paul wrote something about that when it comes to our life. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says this. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because the disciples were willing to surrender, they didn't even care about losing their lives because they were already crucified. It was already done. If it meant that they were going to die for their faith, they were like, cool. I have already laid down my life. I have already surrendered everything. So if, all, if the only thing you can take from me is my life, cool, because when I am done here, I'm going there for eternity. You think you, think you win? No. You're just opening the door for me to experience something I've been waiting on my entire life. When you surrender, that, it leads to boldness. Oftentimes we don't walk in that boldness because we're holding on to an outcome that won't ever happen. We're holding on to an outcome that God has to do this in order for me to believe. God has to do this in order for me to be bold. God has to, whatever it is, in order for us to walk in boldness, we have to surrender. Because it enables us to have an open hand and say, God, whatever you want to put in my hands, put it there. Whatever you want to do with my life, do it, Lord. I just want you to be glorified. And when we live like that, things change. Our priorities change. We can be like the disciples and look at all that's in front of us and go, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's that, that, famous, that famous song, the Lord gives and he takes away. But I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I can only do that when I say, God, I fully surrender. Without full surrender, if God chooses to take something away, then I'm just bitter. Can't believe God would treat me like this. Can't believe this would, he would let this happen. But when we come to him and say, God, I don't understand, but I surrender. Some of you right now are holding on to things that God has asked you to surrender. Whether it be fear, disappointment, a sense of control, or even baggage from past hurts in your life, God is saying, 
surrender. Surrender it to me. Not because he's discounting the things that you've been through. Not because he doesn't know the details. Not because he's oblivious to it. But he just knows that in order for you to find healing, it can't be in your hands anymore. In fact, our hands are too small to carry the problems that we carry. I love what Psalm 95 verse 4 says. It says, he holds in his hands, God's hands, the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. God holds in his hands the depths of the earth, the universe, and the, the earth's mightiest mountains. He holds them in his hands. And what God is communicating to us is that in order for us to find healing, in order for us to, to experience him in a greater way, in order for us to be used by him in a mighty way, we have to come to a place where we say, God, I don't want this in my hands anymore. I want it in your hands. And it's until we make that transition It's until we make that transition that we're going to be in a place of just stress and anxiety and frustration. But when we say, God, I want this in your hands and not mine, it opens the door for peace. We want to talk about peace. <laughs> peace comes from opening our hands and saying, God, I don't want this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I don't want this in my hands. I need to fully surrender it to you. This is not just with our lives, but it's with every part of us. Jesus will not be content with part of you. He will not be content with half of you. He wants all of you. And if we sit back and think for a second that the God of the universe wants every part of us, knowing all the things that we've done, knowing all the sins we've committed, the thoughts we've thought, the ways that we've been selfish, and yet God to this day still says he wants you. Man, that'll touch your heart because you can't find nobody on planet Earth that knows all your stuff and still wants you. It's like even, I know even, even your spouse, you know what I'm saying? Your spouse is with you, but your spouse sometimes don't know all the things. <laughs> Jesus knows all the things, and he still wants to be with you. I love that Jesus shared the, the, the parable of the father who went out to meet his, his son who, is, who was wiling out, <laughs> the prodigal son. And Scripture tells us when the prodigal son was ready to surrender, when he decided to come home. That the father didn't see him afar off and go, you better get away from here. He says he went out to meet him and embraced him with both arms. I'm telling you that today because you may be sitting here and you're like, man, I gave my life to Jesus when I was a kid. And I walked away hard. And I don't know if he's going to receive me back. I'm here to tell you. The Lord is here to tell you, not me, he, that he wants you back more than you can imagine. And that when you choose to turn that corner, it ain't going to be you going to him. He's going to go to you. Amen. He's going to meet you right where you are. But it takes surrender. It takes coming to that place of, God, I just, I don't want it anymore. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of trying to hold on to things and make things work and tired of trying to make that person do what I want them to do and all these different things. Lord, I just want to surrender. I just want to go to sleep at night and have peace. In order for us to do that, we've got to say, God, I surrender. These problems are too big for my hands. I have to put them in yours. In conclusion, surrender for the believer is always an upgrade because it gives us access to what we couldn't do for ourselves. It positions us for healing and it gives us an opportunity for an even greater purpose in this life.